today's talk is not an easy one for me, and not, not easy one for any scholar because uh, you know I have to uh, provide an overview about the whole Japan-U.S. relations uh, from the black sheep to the present. Uh, but I hope my uh, the knowledge I got in Harvard uh, will uh, help me. So let me uh, share you my slide. It's okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the information about manga. So, can we have a look at that? Good, thank you. So the title is very simple, uh, and I try to do this uh, through uh, as interesting anecdotes and context as possible. In case you don't understand what I'm saying, uh, my knowledge is limited and my English is broken, so oh, please interrupt me and uh, through chat or anything, I try to answer this. And to start with, I think I have to uh, illustrate uh, Japan um, before its meeting with the United States. So it's about early modern Japan. Now, oh, since the 13th century, uh, Japan was under the rule of Shogun, uh, the head of the samurai. And from the 17th century uh, up to the, the middle of the 19th century, uh, when the black ship visited Japan, uh, the Shogun was from the uh, Tokugawa family. On the uh, right top, you can see the picture of one of the Shoguns from uh, Tokugawa family. And uh, under the rule of the Shogun, uh, Japan, Japan uh, this archipelago was divided into about 250 feudal domains. And the head of each feudal domain was called daimyo in Japanese. Now, today's uh, member state of the United Nations is less than 200. So in the early modern era, Japan alone was like a an universe. And you can see that the society was highly fluctuated. There was already a notion of state uh, but uh, if a person in the more early modern uh, era uh, mentioned uh, to state, it usually means an each feudal domain, uh, not Japan as a whole. The relations between the uh, shogun and the daimyos. Uh, this is a picture when the last shogun made an important announcement. And the, and this is uh, one hall of the Nijo Castle in Kyoto. Uh, if you have a chance to come to Japan, you have to go to Kyoto and, and try to uh, visit uh, Nijo Castle. And you can see this uh, room. And the uh, shogun was sitting uh, alone uh, on the left. And you can see that the representatives of the major daimyos were uh, sitting uh, and bowing. Uh, far distance uh, from the shogun himself. So you can see that this is a hierarchical uh, society within the elite group. And uh, it is really a hierarchical because you, uh, within this elite group or political uh, class, uh, you had um, samurai uh, warriors. Uh, that, and and the, the household of the samurai occupied about 7% of the whole household of Japan at the time. And the whole population was about uh, 30 million uh, when black ship uh, visited uh, Japan. What was the condition of the samurai? Um, this is a picture of one uh, poor samurai. Uh, you can see that the samurai has a sword. So, and the, so he is a kind of uh, ready to fight. Uh, he has his self-identification as a warrior. But the problem was that, uh, thanks to the dominance, long dominance of the uh, Tokugawa family, there was a, about a two-century peace in Japan. And if you have 7% of the population uh, that are warriors, how you can treat them? That's a huge problem. If you have a civil war, that's okay. Uh, you need samurai, you need warriors, so use them. But uh, that's a long piece. So the shogun and daimyos have to use samurai as bureaucrats. 
and 7% bureaucrats are a bit too much. So you can see that summarized, although they are a part of the ruling class, elite class, and political class, and, and they are uh, proud of that, but still, most of them have to live in poverty. So you can see the kind of fatigue and discontent uh, of this uh, raw ranked samurai. And below them, there are uh, farmers uh, and also craftsmen and also discriminated people. And there are a lot of uh, strife and problems uh, among them. But you can see that the main focus of the frustration of this system was the bottom of the ruling class samurai. Now, apart from those uh, administration or politics uh, centered in Edo, uh, there was a Tenno emperor uh, in Kyoto, uh, an old capital in the West. And the emperor uh, was supposed to have no political power and only, only a kind of spiritual authority. So the uh, structure uh, uh, seems to be quite uh, stable. Uh, and it was actually stable for a long time, but there was an opportunity uh, of inner strife uh, of this country. If the uh, authority, if the authority of the shogun uh, declined, and then the uh, spiritual authority of the emperor uh, became a kind of substantial political one, and uh, dissatisfaction. And, and the misery uh, of the uh, low rank samurai uh, found an ally with the authority of Tenno, the emperor, then the whole structure uh, might be in danger. And that was exactly, exactly what happened uh, thanks to the visit of the black sheep. I'm not condemning the United States, but that's what happened. So let's see how the event of the black sheep and, and afterwards played out. Am I speaking okay? Can, can I speak like this? Yes, it's fine. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, so in, in 1853, um, a black ship, uh, a steamship uh, fleet uh, led by uh, Commodore Matthew Perry uh, visited uh, Tokyo Bay of Japan. And that was a uh, steam warship. Uh, warship so uh, the Japanese population, population were really astonished and overwhelmed. And to prove this, I think it's good. It's a good idea to show the picture, uh, not an accurate picture, but a picture uh, drawn by Japanese painters. So this is one of them. So this is the, uh, one of Perry's uh, black sheep. And you can see the uh, smoke uh, from the chimney of the ship. And I believe it's blacker than it actually was, but you can see that uh, people were, the painter were uh, surprised with the idea of uh, burning the coals and smoke coming from that. And that's a strange, strange wheels, uh, both flanks uh, of the uh, of the ship. And maybe it's bigger than it actually was, but again, you can see the astonishment. And the captain on board uh, was painting uh, like this. Uh, my apology uh, for my American friends. I know uh, many of you are uh, more handsome than that, <laughs> but you can see that how you know or your fleet and your soldiers frighten the Japanese. And uh, with this impact. The Shogunate government, uh, you know, in spite of its long uh, policy of seclusion, uh, blocking the intercourse with uh, foreign countries, apart from uh, some limited trade and correspondence between the Netherlands, China, Korea, and Ryukyu, today Okinawa, uh, the Shogunate government have to decide uh, to sign a treaty with the United States, uh, followed by uh, other European powers. And uh, the treaty itself was a kind of small breakthrough, uh, only promising to give um, good offices, good support uh, to the ships and the crews uh, visiting uh, Japan. Uh, but then the, the, the larger uh, breakthrough was again made by the United States, uh, thanks to the Townsend Harris, 
who came and uh, and and lived in Japan as the general counsel of the United States. He was an old merchant uh, dealing with the Oriental trade, and he had a temper, but also he was a kind person, uh, trying to help uh, both uh, Japan and the United States. And he made a passionate negotiation with the Shogunate government, uh, you know, or inducing uh, the Shogunate uh, to sign uh, another treaty and establish an official diplomatic intercourse as well as uh, free trade uh, in open cities and open ports. And while the uh, Matthew Perry's negotiation was a typical gamble this diplomacy, uh, Townsend Harris' uh, negotiation was a diplomacy without gun because he didn't have a single soldier. He didn't take a single soldier. He didn't take a single warship. Uh, he just had his tongue and mouth. Actually, he used the guns of uh, Britain and France because he repeatedly uh, alarmed uh, Japan that there are strong British fleet and French fleet not around Japan, but around China. And if it's around China, it's around Japan. So in case Japan is too slow uh, to conclude a treaty with the United States, the British and French uh, would come to help Japan uh, to think twice. And that would be an, the next gamble diplomacy. And Japan should rather uh, sign a treaty uh, with a person uh, without a gunboat. And uh, uh, Japan was persuaded. And in 1858, uh, concluded a, a treaty of amity and commerce with the United States, and again followed by a major European powers, such as uh, Britain, France, Netherlands, Russia. I think that was a rational uh, decision uh, for Japan uh, in regard of the uh, military uh, balance of power between Japan and the West, and also in regard of the uh, fundamental weakness of Japan. I mean, if you go to Tokyo, if you go to Osaka, if you go to Fukuoka, Sendai, all major cities of Japan, they are all on the waterfront. So in case you had a bombing from the ocean or, or any kind of maritime blockade, uh, Japan will be suffocated. And so it was a uh, right call uh, to open the country at the time. But as I said, the, the early modern Japan had a um, frustration, and the frustration was a low rank summer. They are not they are not rich, and most of them did not have a prospect for a promotion. So the only source of their pride is being samurai, being people to protect other people, but to protect their master daimyos, master shoguns, and protect the emperor. And they were not provided with such chance because the shogunate opened the country without trying a single fight. And so many of them are really unhappy and generated a seclusion uh, movement accompanied a series of uh, terrors and assassinations. This picture is a Buddhist temple called Tozenji, and it was used as the British legation in Japan at the time. And one night, uh, this legation was, at was attacked by a group of seclusionist samurai. So this guy is a seclusionist samurai, uh, ready for fight in the corridor. And uh, uh, I think that the, the Japanese samurai on the right was an unfortunate one uh, who are told to guard the legation. And because of the ambush, have to fight with his pajama. And uh, the, the person on the left is, I think, British diplomat. And uh, the person on the left, I don't know what he, he's doing. Maybe he's hiding or praying, uh, but... Uh, Sorry for them anyway. And uh, because of the uh, this movement and 
and uh, a series of uh, assassinations and terrors, uh, that the authority of the shogunate uh, decreased uh, from time to time. And eventually, uh, they have to give up their power in 1868. And uh, the new government with the emperor as a nominal court, uh, nominal top uh, was established. And that is uh, what people call Meiji Restoration. Well, recently, more historians call it a Meiji Revolution uh, in regard of the, uh, the fundamental change of politics and also the society. Why there was a fundamental change in society? Because uh, there's really a, a big mystery about uh, this regime change. You know, uh, this regime change was uh, done by low rank some. Uh, they put much pressure on their master dinos and, and, and making them to rebel, rebel uh, against the shogun. And they are particularly uh, successful in the Western or Southern part of Japan, like Yamaguchi prefecture today, and Kagoshima prefecture today. So the government substantially, or the, the power of government uh, eventually rested in the hand of the low rank samurai uh, from Yamaguchi prefecture and Kagoshima prefecture. And imagine you are one of those samurai and you get the power, you get everything, and what you would do? Usually you would have parties at your residence and invite your friends to the parties and you enjoy yourself, right? Uh, but that's not what the samurai did. Uh, what they did is to abolish uh, chomage, uh, the strange hairstyle of the samurai, and they forbid their uh, their colleagues uh, to uh, to have their own souls on the street, and they introduced a conscription system. Six years after the uh, restoration, very soon. Uh, abandoning uh, the obligation and privileges of the samurai to fight uh, in the battles. And, and on the basis of that, uh, remove the salaries uh, paid to the samurai. So uh, most of the samurai were, you know, uh, put on the, uh, you know, uh, the poverty, uh, more severe uh, than the early modern era. So that is a kind of the social suicide, right? You know, uh, the people who got the power deny the privilege of their own class. And it happened because uh, they were already uh, the focus of the frustration before. So, you know, and they knew that they have to change the whole system uh, to make him, themselves and their children, grandchildren, uh, really uh, happier. And what they wanted is um, uh, freedom of occupation, you know, as long as you have to be in samurai and your children, your grandchildren have to be samurai uh, forever, then there's no chance that, there, there's real, very little chance that they could get out of uh, this miserable conditions. So what they wanted is um, freedom of, of occupation, you know, that they can change their occupations without losing their pride, without humiliating themselves. And so that's why uh, this change of regime um, brought Japan a society based on meritocracy, meritocracy, you know, uh, the bureaucracy based on meritocracy and private farms are based on, of course, personal networks, but also largely a sense of uh, meritocracy. And that's why Japan's modernization na and nation state building uh, was uh, were quite uh, successful. Maybe I talk too much about the commencement of modern Japan, so I will try to be uh, quick. But again, uh, let me talk about the impact of the United States on this process. Uh, especially, you know, I, I talk about the nation state building and the modernization, and it's about the, uh, about the uh, inner process. But Japan also has to be successful in trade, and otherwise their decision to open the country uh, would face uh, even stronger uh, opponents inside, and their policy might be reversed, or they have to fight with the West, and that will lead to the defeat on the side of Japan. So why Japanese trade, foreign trade, free trade work? And in this regard, the United States was very important. But let me show you the broad picture. So from 
1942 to 42, there was an opium war uh, in China, uh, China versus Britain and China versus France, right? And and from 1856 to 60, there was a um, second opium war, and and in both cases, China, uh, Qin Dynasty, were defeated. And thanks to that, due to that, uh, China have to sign an unequal treaties uh, with Europe and the United States, and they have to open their interior. Sorry. And so you can see that maybe the ships wasn't like that, but uh, the, the Western powers had an access uh, through the uh, river uh, to the interior of China. And if you look at India uh, from 1857 to 59, uh, there's a Sepoy mutiny. And today we knew that the re rebels against Britain was not just Sepoys, but other common people. So usually we call it Indian rebellion. And India was defeated and the Britain won. So Britain started on a formal colonization of India, which meant that uh, the railroad uh, by uh, the British uh, were uh, uh, gained an access uh, to the core of India. So you have um, the core of China and the core of India thrown into the global market. So you can see that when Japan opened that, uh, the country, uh, the global economic market was enlarging uh, to a significant uh, degree. And the uh, United States uh, provided a cotton uh, to those new markets, uh, which promised a um, uh, huge profit uh, to the United States. But then the United States started its own civil war. And because of that, uh, the export of cotton from the United States uh, had stopped. And uh, I think that's the time Japan should thank the United States because uh, that gave an opportunity to Japan to sell their own cotton. The amount was smaller than uh, the United States, but still it promised the initial profit uh, of the free trade to Japan, which made the whole process of opening the country easier uh, for the Shogunate government and the society. But then uh, the United States ended its civil war without consulting Japan. So you can see that there's an uh, the, the uh, reemergence of the American cotton. But there's already an, a cotton from Japan and cotton from elsewhere. So you had an uh, excessive supply of cotton, which initiated at the end of the 1860s, the first global uh, depression uh, in the world history. And uh, Britain was fr frightened, and the Netherlands was frightened. And they realized that they need an independent central government uh, to monitor the currency and monitor uh, the uh, bubble uh, economy. So that was the commencement of the system of central banks. And so United States Civil War had a huge impact on the world history. And they did it without consulting Japan and other countries. No offense. But uh, I'm trying to say that it had an interesting uh, influence on Japan because when the depression came, that wasn't really uh, the the tipping point of the Japan, Japanese domestic politics. Whether the Shogunate government would survive or the, the emperor's uh, new government uh, would emerge. And the depression made the Shogunate government uh, really, really difficult uh, to handle the situation. So the, the end of the Civil War had uh, some a cause uh, which led to the uh, major restoration. I'm, I'm, t I'm trying to tell that the United States impact the world without uh, your intention and without sometimes you are uh, you are knowing you are knowing this. Now, uh, after the major restoration or revolution, uh, Japan's main agenda was the revision of the treaty. Uh, and initiated by uh, Townsend Harris because it had it contained. Uh, some limitations of Japan's sover sovereignty. I'm not getting e e into the details uh, of those uh, negotiations. It's highly technical, uh, but I, I can tell you that, uh, uh, you know, uh, why, why Japan was so anxious to do that was, uh, you know, oh, the new government uh, gained their power thanks to the seclusion is summarized, but to establish their power, uh, the new government needed the uh, uh, support and recognition 
of the United States and other European powers. So they have to admit and recognize the treaties signed by the Shogunate government, their former enemy. And to explain this uh, decision uh, to the Security Union Samurai, their power base, they have to declare that, well, we accept the treaties by Townsend Harris, but at least we will revise that. So the treaty revision became a kind of the political obligation uh, for the new Japan, for modern Japan. So that's why Japan kept on trying this uh, without a prospect of success. And the United States was um, extremely helpful. That was the first uh, power, a uh, treaty power uh, that uh, rendered help uh, to this uh, negotiation. And the, uh, the remarkable uh, event took place in 1879. Uh, the uh, Japanese minister to the United States, Yoshida Kiyonari, and uh, uh, Secretary of State, William Ebert, uh, signed a convention and returned Japan uh, Paris autonomy. That was the first major breakthrough of Japanese uh, treaty revision. And I think Japanese high school students have more than once heard about this convention. But uh, also famously, uh, this convention had a condition precedent. To effectuate uh, this convention, um, the other European treaty powers, European treaty powers have to agree with uh, similar uh, conventions. And uh, uh, European powers, uh, as Japan and the United States predicted, uh, were not ready uh, to agree uh, with that. So actually the convention, this convention between the United States and Japan uh, never uh, took came into force. And uh, it is remembered uh, as the limitation of American benevolence, right? The Americans signed the convention, which is nice, but uh, they put in condition precedent. And actually the convention never took place, never came into force. Yes, that was the limitation uh, of the United States. United States had a self-identification. United States was a new country and it's different from the uh, old continent Europe, polluted by imperialism. United States is a new ideal country. And, and they cast their self-identification to their policy on, the, on their policy towards East Asia. So United States was, uh, in many cases, uh, kind and, 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 and supportive uh, to Japan, China, Sham. And um, they try to be a good teacher, good educator uh, to the uh, developing country uh, in East Asia. But they did it because they wanted to, partly, partly they, because they, uh, the United States wanted to differentiate, differentiate itself uh, with uh, Europe, which means that the United States was not, not ready to be entangled uh, with uh, European international uh, politics. So United States was kinder than Europe, but the United States is not kind enough to persuade Europe to negotiate to, 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 to compromise uh, with Japan or other East Asian countries. Um, that's the limitation of the uh, United States power and will uh, to support East Asia. So very helpful for East Asia countries, but that, there was a limitation. And actually, uh, the condition precedent was inserted in, in this convention, um, not by the United States, but by Japan, because Japan had already known the limitation of the United States. So they need this condition uh, so as not to upset and annoy European powers too much. You know, well, we signed the United States, uh, uh, we signed the convention with the United States uh, at first, but we are always looking at you, European uh, powers. So we inserted a condition precedent so that uh, arrangement with United, with United States will not uh, take place, uh, you know, leaving the European treaty powers. That's, that's the excuse and Japan needed. And maybe that's a part, maybe Japanese uh, students uh, do not know exactly. So it's, it's not that the United States put it, but Japan put it. But there's um, uh, certainly a limitation 
that the United States could do for Japan. And I think, in a sense, Japan learned it from it too much. And Japan made an, uh, a kind of swift estrangement from the United States to Europe. For two television, Japan decided to negotiate with Europe at first, uh, rather than the United States since the 1880s. So in 1880s, Japan asked Germany to help. And in return, uh, Japan imported many railroad stuff or gas company uh, materials from Germany, and also uh, the idea of law codes and constitution uh, from uh, Germany as well. And Germany helped Japan negotiate with the United Kingdom, uh, the kind of last boss, the, 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 the most formidable uh, counterpart of negotiation in the West. And 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 uh, United Kingdom uh, gradually uh, yield to Japan demand. In 1894, uh, UK signed a new treaty with Japan, uh, followed by other European powers and reluctantly uh, by the United States. So that's the end of the early friendship uh, between Japan and the United States. And as we uh, as the era proceeded uh, into the 20th century, uh, the situation became even more difficult. Uh, because of the successful national state building, uh, Japan uh, won the war with uh, China uh, from 1894 to 95, and also the war with uh, Russia. Uh, that was a close and miserable victory, uh, but Japan anyway won the war with Russia uh, that took place from 1904 to 1905. And since then, Japan became an imperial power in East Asia. It's like an wolf among the sheep. Japan was the only country that really succeeded in its state building and uh, Navy and Army building as well. And uh, in the meantime, the uh, United States fought war with Spain uh, to uh, clean up the, uh, its backyard, uh, Cuba. And as Spain had um, its colony in Philippines, uh, U.S. had uh, Philippines as a colony, although the president at the time could not uh, place Philippines on the map. Anyway, uh, United States suddenly became uh, a kind of uh, one of the major powers in uh, East Asia as well. So there's a competition uh, over China uh, between United States and Japan. Well, to be more, uh, f to be fair, uh, Japan was already an imperial power trying to advance into the Chinese con continent. And the United States was not uh, doing that. So the United States approach was more economic and cultural. And after the revolution in China, uh, showed a sympathy uh, on China as a sister a republic. So uh, that's a competition uh, between Imperial Japan and open door diplomacy of the United States. And Japan was somehow unprepared uh, with this situation. Japan made an, I think Japan under assessed uh, the US will and eagerness uh, to support China because Japan already had an experience. You know, you may make mistakes if you lack experience, but you can also make mistakes if you have experience. The experience of the 19th century was that the United States was very kind, supportive, but there's a limitation of their support. That's what Japan experienced, and that, that's what Japan learned. So United States is an anti-imperialistic power, but their actual support has its own limitation. And Japan somehow expected that, the, that, that, that it applied to the case of China, but actually it didn't, because at the time, Japan was too big, and the United States was bigger than it used to be in the 19th century. So if you see the situation around Japan, uh, there's a naval race uh, with the United States and sympathy on China. And, and partly uh, encouraged with that, there was a growing nationalism uh, in China. And it was against Britain, but uh, also uh, against Japan. And at the end of the First World War, uh, there was a revolution in Russia. 
and, the, and Japan have to face the communist Russia. And if you see the South, uh, there are many, uh, most territories are, are, are colonized by uh, Britain and France and the Netherlands. So Japan gradually developed a sense of victim besieged. Japan and its count uh, counterparts uh, still try to uh, accommodate with the new situation. In 1921, uh, United States summoned the International Conference in Washington, D.C., called Washington Conference. Um, that's remarkable because, you know, uh, in regard of its long tradition of isolationism, that was the first official international conference that this country summoned. And, uh, uh, and in, through this conference, United States, Japan, and European major powers signed a series of treaties respecting China's uh, sovereignty. Um, but the condition was to also respect uh, treaty privileges uh, that Western Japan uh, already possessed. And also naval disarmament among the United States, Britain, France, and Japan. Japan accepted that and then trying to uh, live uh, with uh, this uh, what people call Washington system uh, today. But uh, uh, the condition was that China was kept out from the actual decision-making uh, and also Russia was kept out because it was communism. But you can see that the Soviet Union's power in the, uh, in the uh, East Asia, as well as in Europe was uh, growing. And also the nationalism of China was growing and, and the Washington system was not good enough for them. And so the, uh, the uh, international uh, arrangement uh, became uh, increasingly uh, difficult. And uh, uh, China started to abolish the treaty privileges of the West and Japan, uh, not through negotiation, uh, but through the uh, power of police forces. Well, there's a uh, coupling uh, with such uh, coercive abandonment of privileges and the peaceful negotiation. So the situation was very mixed. And, uh, uh, but Japan could not uh, cope with that adequately. And in 1931, started a blatant a military campaign in Manchuria, at the north, northern eastern part of China, and made, made a puppet empire there, a Manchurian empire. And uh, China could not uh, accept that, of course. Uh, so from 1937, uh, eventually, uh, they started an uh, total war uh, with uh, Japan. And, uh, and to try to uh, blockade uh, the Western assistance to China, uh, Japan advanced to the Southeast Asia. Uh, which uh, deeply annoyed uh, European powers and the United States. And eventually, uh, from 1941, uh, war with the United States and its allies started, which led to the uh, total defeat of Japan and the collapse of the Japanese empire. Sorry, uh, I have to uh, go quickly to the uh, post war era. Now, uh, that's a picture of uh, Tokyo uh, at the end of the war. So you can see that because of the bombardment, uh, Japan, uh, Tokyo was, uh, was flat. So that was a uh, disaster uh, for Japan. And the Japanese people had no stomach for war. And uh, uh, Prime Minister Yoshida Shigeru was very clear that the top priority is an economic reconstruction. And for this purpose, uh, he was ready to sacrifice everything. So he decided to put Japan under the umbrella of the United States uh, for security. In 1951, uh, Yoshida signed a peace treaty in San Francisco. And that was a partial treaty because uh, Japan uh, had an armistice, armistice uh, with, only with the United States and its allies and some uh, neutral powers. And Soviet Union broke uh, bloc, uh, did not join it. But still, uh, Japan decided to live with the United States. And on the same day, Yoshida signed a security treaty with the United States, uh, offering 
military base in Japan to the uh, United States, and in return, asking United States to protect Japan. Now, compared with the uh, pre-war era, you know, in pre-war era, uh, the power of the United States was limited. So there was an option for estrangement uh, uh, from the United States in case there was a desertion by the United States. But in this time, I mean, in post-war era, there was no such option. So if there was a sense of desertion, uh, Japan or other US allies tried to, you know, uh, embrace the United States and stay with us, right? And, but also uh, because the United States was a dominant power and, 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 and you know, the, the world order, global order as a whole, uh, was the concern of the United States. Uh, in the eyes of the American allies, the United States may uh, start a war uh, that was not relevant uh, to the country, to uh, to the uh, to each to specific uh, American ally. So there's always a sense of desertion and sense of entanglement as well. And the United States and, and its allies have to keep balance uh, or have to have to uh, endeavor uh, to reduce the sense of entanglement and desertion. And let's see, let's see how you know, Japan and the United States uh, cope with this uh, dilemma. There are two major events. One uh, was a uh, revision of the security treaty in 1960. So at the time, uh, Eisenhower administration uh, promoted a new look uh, policy. Uh, they wanted to reduce the budget, military budget, uh, during the uh, Second World War. And so uh, Eisenhower uh, had a tendency to rely on uh, rely more on nuclear deterrence and then try to reduce the army, uh, not only in the United States, but especially the army abroad, and, and try to establish a high readiness troop. And for this purpose, you know, uh, Eisenhower administration was ready to withdraw unnecessary troops uh, from abroad, but in case of emergency, they have to send troops uh, to abroad. And for this purpose, it's very important that the partner or allied countries of the United States had a good feeling with the United States and American troops. And for this purpose, uh, Eisenhower was ready to revise the treaty, which look unequal. Uh, in the eyes of its allies and partners. That's why I think uh, treaty revision with Japan uh, took place. And in uh, through this negotiation, uh, United States accept a uh, prior consultation uh, procedure. So in case uh, United States forces in Japan uh, made a significant move or significant change of its equipment, uh, including the introduction of the nuclear weapon to Japan, uh, Japanese government would have a prior consultation with the United States. And also, the uh, United States made a, a formal commitment for Japan's uh, defense. In the prior uh, treaty, uh, everybody knew that the United States would protect Japan in case of crisis, but now it was uh, clearly stipulated in the new uh, security treaty. So with this, uh, with prior consultation, it reduced the fear of entanglement with the U.S. war. And with this commitment, uh, it reduced the, it reduced the uh, risk of desertion uh, in the eyes of the Japanese population. Not, not everything was solved. Uh, like, you know, or even under this prior consultation, United States have to make clear that when uh, the crisis takes place in uh, Korean Peninsula, um, U.S. forces may have to uh, move from Japan to Korea uh, without an adequate consultation with the Japanese government. So they have to make a secret promise about Korea. You know, there's a prior consultation procedure, but South Korean Peninsula is an exception, and it was a secret promise. And that pro uh, and the next event was the reversion of Okinawa uh, in 19, and which was promised in 1967 and effectuated in uh, 1972. And when the agreement was made, uh, Prime Minister Sato Esaku uh, with his photo and President Nixon made a joint uh, statement declaring that the Prime Minister deeply appreciated the peacekeeping efforts of the United Nations in the area, which means Korea, 
and stated that the security of the Republic of Korea, South Korea, was essential to Japan's own security. And it looks like a boring statement of politicians, um, but actually, this actually meant that, you know, under the prior consultation system, if United States wanted to uh, move their forces uh, to Korea, Japan would say yes, because it's essential for Japan. So that's a joint statement, public joint statement, uh, which made the previous secret promise unnecessary. So United States and Japan gradually, you know, try to make their relations healthier. You know, once make a secret promise, but later, uh, you know, with the impact of the reversion of the Okinawa, uh, Japan publicly announced that, you know, Japan would, you know, cooperate with the uh, United States and the United Nations uh, forces uh, uh, operation uh, in Korea. Uh, in case of emergency and necessity. And it's kind of a reward of Japan's acceptance of entanglement with the United States world strategy. So that's how, you know, uh, United States and Japan try to, you know, uh, coordinate uh, their relations. And I think it's roughly the same with the United States and other allies. And if I make an, um, some comments on the present situation uh, at the end of my talk. Um, I have to say that Trump made some innovation um, in regard of this historical context with the United States and its allies. What Trump did is to, you know, is somehow very new, very strange. Uh, he raised the fear of entanglement and the fear of desertion simultaneously in his administration. Usually the game was that, you know, if you reduce the fear of entanglement, uh, that would increase the fear of desertion and vice versa. So there's always a dilemma and there's always a CISO game. And so, you know, the allies have to keep on making efforts and making plans and making negotiations. And the negotiation is not easy. Not just for the allies, but for the United States. But what Trump did is that he increased both. And, and it, worked quite well in a sense, because, you know, if those fear both increase, then the allies have to cooperate, you know. Even if Trump further increased the sense of desertion, at least uh, we have to understand that, well, well, at least that will not increase the sense of entanglement. And so it's, maybe it's better than status quo. And um, like, like, you know, if Trump suddenly announced that he's gonna meet the leader of North Korea, that was an astonishment. And and Japan and other, maybe South Korea fear that, you know, uh, the United States will forget about the uh, previous arranging among the countries in East Asia. But, you know, at least it's better than Trump suddenly attacking North Korea with nuclear weapons and then that would be the disaster. So, you know, there was a sense of desertion but, you know, because there's already a sense of entanglement uh, thanks to Trump's, you know, abrupt uh, moves and changes of politics, um, I think uh, United States partners and allies were ready to accept that. And vice versa, you know, sometimes uh, well, Trump's policy towards Iran and later China, uh, his policy or language was sometimes uh, well, uh, you know, too strong. But so there's a growing sense of entanglement among its allies and partners. But, you know, since there's already a sense of desertion, uh, they uh, generally uh, accept that. So if you uh, increase the fear of entanglement and desertion both, then uh, that will decrease the complaint. That's, I think, Trump's innovation. Does that work forever? I don't think so, because as you see from the uh, history of 20th century uh, of the United States and Japan, there's always a risk of misassessment. The misassessment among the government is always uh, quite uh, huge. And, and, and Trump's policy uh, may increase uh, such risks, risks within the government. 
And even if the relation between governments uh, could be uh, accommodated, uh, could be uh, uh, coordinated, uh, we have to think about the trust uh, between peoples, or well, trust between the, the Japanese people and the uh, Trump administration. The situation for Japan was very difficult vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and North Korea. So Japan is uh, more prepared uh, to cooperate uh, with the United States. Uh, but uh, Trump's language and Trump's uh, policy are not unnecessarily helpful. And uh, if I can, you know, I, I keep on asking the United States to do something or to uh, stop doing something. But of course, there's Japan's role. And, and Japan has to uh, play a more active role uh, for the security uh, of this region. And uh, uh, last year, uh, Japan uh, revised uh, three important documents uh, regarding its security policy. And now the, uh, the language and basic tone of the Japanese policy is really clear. Uh, Japan will live with the alliance with the United States and expand Japan's role uh, to uh, cooperate with the United States and its allies and partners. But uh, that would uh, lead to the significant uh, raise of the Japanese budget. And to pay this, uh, I think Japan have to raise its taxes. But as Japanese people are really, you know, you know, Abbas uh, to the uh, raise of tax traditionally. Uh, so there has not yet a clear prospect of uh, arranging the budget uh, for the for the strengthening uh, for the uh, for the defense. So there's a role Japan should play, and it's not a, just a security policy, but it's a, it's fiscal policy, and to a, to a significant degree. Uh, to change its fundamental character of its democracy. So there's a lot ahead for Japan and the United States. And I think it's, it's really great to have this kind of opportunity uh, to, to talk about Japanese history and, and relations of Japan and the United States. So I again thank Clay and his colleagues uh, to give me this uh, opportunity. Thank you so much.